Welcome back boys, my name is Rob and in this episode I'm going to share with you the top 10 mistakes I see people make buying project boats. Now before we go into the top 10 mistakes I see people making on project boats, I want to talk about why you should consider getting a project boat in the first place. So let's cut to this. Are you thinking about buying a new boat? Please consider adopting a project boat instead. Millions of old, unwanted, badass project boats sit outside every night, alone and abandoned across this country, waiting for their forever home. By adopting a project boat, you're not only helping reduce the waste and promote sustainable boating practices, you're also saving a haul that is likely cooler and faster than what boat companies produce today. So instead of buying a boring new boat, please consider adopting a badass project boat instead. Together, we can make a difference, one boat at a time. Wow, that was powerful stuff. All right, so obviously restoring a boat, getting a project boat, very good idea. But there are a bunch of mistakes you can make. In fact, my first project boat was kind of a disaster. It wasn't reliable. It wasn't fun. I wound up losing a ton of money on it. Now, did I learn some things? Yes. Did those skills transfer over to my next boat? Yes. But the purpose of this video is to help you minimize the mistakes and the money you're going to spend while maximizing your chances of success and fun. All right, top 10 mistakes I see people make buying a project boat. These are gonna be in no particular order except for the last one, which is the number one reason, the number one reason that happens most often that I see with people restoring boats. It's a huge problem, and hopefully this will help you avoid being in that situation. Mistake number 10, storage. Now, when you go look at a project boat, or even before you go look at it, where was this boat stored? If it was stored outside, it's questionable. Boats are only waterproof one way, and as soon as moisture gets inside, things rapidly go to hell. The upholstery starts getting mold and mildew, and if that moisture does not get out of there, it's gonna rot out your stringer, which is the backbone of your boat, and maybe your transom, maybe the floor. It's just gonna mess things up. So the, the thing you wanna do is find a boat that's been stored indoors or the owner actually cared enough to keep water out. If it's outside and it has a tarp on it, probably run away. Moisture is the number one killer of boats, okay? It's, it's, I know that they're supposed to be waterproof, but they're not, and a lot of these older boats are built like total shit. Okay, so let's go to number nine. It's been stored indoors, you're excited, you show up. What's the first thing you see? You're all geeked? The exterior. So let's talk about that a second. Boats are not like cars, they are not painted. This is gel coat. The way they are created is there is a female mold and boats are built from the outside in. The first thing that you put in that mold is the gel coat. After that, it's the fiberglass and the resin and stuff. So the structure is inside, but it goes on last. What that means, is that you'll never be able to duplicate factory gel coat. If I took this boat and sanded it down and resprayed it with paint, it might look pretty, but it's not gonna be durable. Any scratch is gonna be pretty much irreparable. Whereas right now, all this gel coat, I can just sand it and polish it, and it's gonna look beautiful again. What you are gonna wanna look for are stress cracks. I'm gonna show you some on this boat. These cracks, you're pretty much never gonna be able to get rid of them. Now, if you want to, you could try v them out and filling gel coat and sanding and polishing, but the likelihood of the colors matching, probably nil. The nice thing though, is if it is factory gel coat, you can bring it back to life. In this video up here, I show you three simple steps on how you can bring faded, ugly, chalky gel coat back to life and make it beautiful again. Number eight, floor tests. What you're gonna wanna do is get inside the boat and walk around and you're just gonna hop around a little bit and you're just gonna feel for soft spots on the floor. Now, again, I said all these old boats are built like crap. This is a perfect example. This is a 1980s CB Avenger and you can see that the floor is not even covered in resin. It's just bare wood. They just added fiberglass to the outer edge and that's it. What that means is that this plywood is not waterproofed. As soon as moisture sits in here, it's gonna start rotting the floor. Now, a floor replacement is not a big deal. Uh, I'm actually gonna do a floor replacement in this boat in one weekend, and that video is gonna be coming out hopefully next week. But just walk around and know that if there's a soft spot in the, in, in the floor of your boat, it's not the end of the world, but you are gonna have to repair it or it's just gonna get worse. Number seven, avoid jets and V-drives. Oh, jet boats, jet boats are cool. Jet no, 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 avoid jets. Jets, uh, okay, look, 
I like fast boats, jet boats can be fast, but jets are notoriously inefficient. The same horsepower boat with the same hull will go faster with a prop, whether it be outboard or stern drive, versus a jet. On top of that, if you live in an area that has weeds in the lake, you're gonna constantly be getting out of your boat to declog the weeds. V-drive, also a problem because they don't trim. Anytime you go any place shallow, you're gonna ding up that prop that you can possibly damage the rudder on it. That's gonna be really annoying to service. It's gonna be hard to do it yourself. Same with the jet. Trying to find someone to service a jet, pain in the ass. Just avoid jets. They suck fuel, they're not fast. Avoid V-drives. They're not a really good idea for a project boat. So it's not a jet and it's not a V-drive. What brand should it be? Mercury. If it's an OMC, run the other way. I don't care how nice the boat is, it's not worth it. OMC has been out of business for years now. Finding parts is gonna be a pain in the ass and finding service techs to work on it, also a pain in the ass. Avoid Volvo Penta, that's gonna be harder to service. Avoid anything else, just get a Mercruiser or a Mercury outboard and your life will be so much easier and you'll have a faster boat, all right? Number six, so it's got some Mercury product hanging off the back of it. I don't care if it's an outboard or a stern drive. What you're gonna to wanna to do is look at the outdrive itself. And you're gonna to wanna to look for major signs of damage. Now a little chipping like this, not really a big deal. If the skeg's beat up, that isn't really a big deal either. It honestly doesn't matter a ton unless you get to like really fast speeds. You do wanna look at a prop. Make sure the prop isn't too dinged up. If it's stainless, that's a huge plus because stainless gives you a lot better hole shot and a higher top speed, better gas mileage. Aluminum props just aren't really that great. What you're gonna to wanna to look for on the outdrive itself though are just signs of cracks or repair. So just look, look for major damage on the gear case torpedo itself. The other thing you wanna to do to make sure that it's working correctly, even if the boat doesn't run, is just shift it into forward and then go back here and try to spin the prop. What you're gonna find is that the prop doesn't spin one direction and it does spin the other and clicks. So this will not turn counterclockwise. I'm gonna go back up here. I'm gonna shift it into reverse. Now I'm gonna go back here and the prop is gonna spin counterclockwise, but it should not spin clockwise. That means the gears inside your lower unit are good. Now it still might have some shifting problems. There's a million ways to adjust the cables and the shifter. I'm not gonna get into that in this video, but it's not really the end of the world to adjust things. You just check in for major expensive repairs. Number five, engine inspection. So. Hopefully you wanna hear it run. What you wanna do is tell the seller to not start it. If, if it's already warm when you get there, they could be hiding some cold start problems. You wanna make sure that engine is cold as a bone before you start it. To start it, you're just gonna hook up muffs and a hose to the water pickup and then see if it turns over and catches and runs. The other thing you could do, which is a good idea if you have the time, is to bring a compression tester. You can rent these at any auto parts store for free. You just put down a deposit when you return it they give you your money back. And what you're gonna to wanna to do is just unplug the spark plugs, thread it in there, and crank over the engine without it starting. Now, there's a couple ways you can do that. I'm not gonna get into it, but what you're looking for is even compression across all cylinders. If all the cylinders have good compression except one, you're gonna have a bad time, because that means an engine rebuild. Number four, misjudging your skill set. Now, do you have basic mechanical aptitude? Can you change a flat? Can you change a spark plug? Have you worked with composites before and fiberglass resins? None of these things are inherently hard or difficult, and I encourage everyone to try new things and learn from it because that's how you grow as a person and upgrade your skill set. But you do want to like not go into this totally blind and be like, I can do everything. You can, it's just going to take longer. That leads us to number three, misjudging the time you're going to spend fixing these turds. Now, when I bought my Aristocrat, I wanted to get it on the water the same year that I bought it. Didn't happen, and I worked on it almost every weekend. I slaved away. I got it almost done, but at the end of the day, it just got cold too quickly, and I couldn't get it in the water till the next season. So, if you've done this stuff before, you'll probably be better at estimating how much time it's going to take you to get it on the water. But other than that, you're probably just going to have to guesstimate it and double it. And that might be correct, probably not. Number two, checking the transom, boys. This is the single most important part of your boat structurally, and if it's bad, it is a massive pain in the ass, especially on an outboard boat that has a splash well. Now, if your transom is exposed 
all the way and you don't have any fiberglass splash well, it's going to be a lot easier to repair, so maybe it's not as big of a deal. But if you have something like this, where the transom goes down and has a splash well, replacing this is a huge pain in the ass. So you're going to want to check that really, really well. I did a video uh, that you can check out up here that, that's five ways of checking a transom on a project boat. Check that out if you want to learn more, but there's a hammer test, there's a visual inspection, there's a flex test. Check that video out to learn more about checking your transom, but that is super vitally important. But if the transom is bad, that is going to massively spiral your project into major, major repair status, and you, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be an uphill battle. Number one problem. Okay, this is going to hurt some feelings, but I'm trying to help you guys. Is it worth restoring or not? Now, what you have to consider is that there are a bunch of boats for sale at any given time. What you want to do is restore something that is actually cool. Now, that means that the tri-haul that your neighbor has or the cabin cruiser from the early 80s, like the bay liners, the stuff that was really common that you see most often is probably not going to be worth restoring. Now, you can make exceptions for sentimental reasons, and I understand that if, you're, if it was your grandpa's boat or your dad's boat or something, yeah, I guess at that point, uh, money is not really worth considering because it means more to you than what it's actually worth. But for everyone else, just buying a boat from a stranger that they don't have any connection to, it needs to be a cool boat. This is a CB Avenger. Every time I take it out, people are like, oh, that boat's awesome. Now, if I did the same thing with like a 70s Sea Ray with an inline six, do you think anyone would say that? No, they wouldn't. There is a reason that people restore sports cars and muscle cars, and that reason is desirability. When you see people dumping tons of money into like a four-door sedan or like a Dodge Omni or something, you just got to shake your head and be like, what is up with this person? But I see this happening on boat restorations all the time. You know, it was only a hundred dollars and now I just need to spend money fixing the transom and the upholstery and the floor. And it's like, dude, here's the thing. They made a ton of those. There are a ton of them. You can buy them all over the place and you're going to spend less time and money in the end than if you did it yourself. Now, just because something's rare doesn't mean it's cool. There's a, the, the, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, they only made this 1978 Sea Ray for two years. And, 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 and dude, who cares? It's, it's a tri haul and it, it's open bow. It's just, it's, it's, that is the equivalent of restoring a 1983 Ford Aerostar minivan. It's just, it's not worth your time. If it has an inline six stern drive, don't do it. If it has a V6 stern drive, I don't know, unless it's really cool, skip it. If it has a V8, okay, now we're talking, but let's look at the rest of the boat. What you're going to want to look for are boats that have a cult following that are actually cool. Look for the sports car boats. I'm trying not to like ruin the market right now, but you can find deals on any kind of boat. They're all going to require pretty much the same amount of work. Restoring a CB Avenger or a Sleecraft or a Hydrostream is not inherently more work than restoring a Bayliner or a Sea Ray or something else that's just sort of whatever. Sea Ray actually though did make cool boats. Check out the Pachanga series. The Pachanga 1, Pachanga 2, they had them all the way up to like 30 feet. All those boats are killer. Look at uh, Glastron Carlson's. That's a subsidiary of Glastron. And they, they made the most attractive boat designs you've ever seen in your life. The stern of a CVX-20 is probably still probably one of the prettiest transoms you're ever going to see ever made. And those boats are worth restoring because they are cool, dudes. Don't restore a boat that isn't cool. If you have questions if your boat is cool or not, or if, if, if you're wondering if it's worth it, just leave a comment here and I'll tell you if it sucks. Now, can you have fun on pretty much any boat? Yeah, but the point of this video is to help people avoid the mistake of becoming way underwater on a boat that is not desirable because at that point, you're throwing your money down the drain and you're throwing your time down the drain. This thing is always going to be cool. It's always going to be desirable because it's fast and it looks good. Again, this is just my opinion. I know some of you guys are super passionate about your boring open bow family boats and that's fine, but the reality is, is that they're going to be hard to sell and you're more likely to wind up underwater in terms of the time and money you invest in restoring these boats. So just start with something desirable and you're probably gonna come out closer to even 
or maybe even a head depending on how rad it is. So if you're new to this channel and you haven't been here before, please check out a couple of my videos. I have a 400 horsepower Sleekcraft Aristocrat. I also have an in-depth restoration of a Sleekcraft SST race boat where I'm using the most advanced composites I could find trying to build the craziest, fastest thing I can for as little amount of money as possible. Speaking of which, I also have another series where I'm trying to hit 60 miles an hour for under 1,000 bucks with this CB Avenger. All right, thanks for watching this video. Hope you guys learned something. Hope this helps people out. And if I pissed you off by telling you your boat's lame, I'm sorry. I, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm just trying to help people. Start with number one, which is make sure it is a cool boat. If it's a cool boat, it's worth it. All right, cheers dudes, Till next time.